Sup, chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. Well, like I promised in my last video on finasteride dosing, today I'm going to take a balls deep dive into the science behind the risk of getting side effects from finasteride. Now obviously, as wonderful and effective as finasteride is, even its most diehard supporters will admit that like any other drug, there is at least a small risk of side effects. However, if you go to any hair loss forum or subreddit that focuses on the subject of hair loss, you'll see a lot of people complaining about finasteride side effects, which far outnumber the amount of people who speak positively about the drug. This gives the impression to a lot of hair loss newcomers that finasteride side effects are actually quite a bit more frequent and worse than what the medical literature indicates, which leads to a lot of hesitation amongst hair loss sufferers to begin treatment. This discrepancy between the reported incidence of side effects from the actual clinical trials of finasteride, which is low, compared to the anecdotal reports you see on forums is due to the fact that most people who take finasteride and have a good experience with it will usually just get on with their lives and forget about hair loss, while the small number of people who do get adverse sides from finasteride are much more likely to spread fear about it online since scaring other people out of taking finasteride is their way of coping with the fact that they can't take finasteride or they're simply just too afraid to use it. This is of course a huge problem because when it comes to fighting hair loss, time is of the essence. The longer you wait, the worse things are going to get, and there's only so much lost ground a pharmaceutical intervention model can make up for before surgery becomes a necessity for complete hair restoration. Remember, even male castrates don't necessarily regrow hair because once DHT destroys the hair follicle and fibrosis sets in, then there's nothing that is going to restore your hair other than a hair transplant. The point is though, is that the sooner people get on actual treatment and the less time people waste doing nothing out of fear of finasteride or trying to seek out unproven or unsafe alternatives, the better it will be for them long term. And the best option is to get on an FDA approved treatment before losing ground since as great as finasteride is, oftentimes maintenance is the best we can hope for while on treatment. That is why I tell people not to wait until you lose ground, get on treatment now, do not wait. Furthermore, thanks to hair loss forums and subreddits being dominated by finasteride-hating fear-mongerers, excessive paranoia-driven misinformation about finasteride may cause people to take the drug while feeling anxiety about the potential risk of side effects, which could lead to a nocebo effect where an individual taking finasteride will be convinced that finasteride is causing them a problem, when in reality, the so-called problem is simply psychosomatic and not the fault of finasteride. This nocebo effect is very powerful and more common than a lot of people think. In fact, it's something I myself fell for early on in my struggles against hair loss. Having been introduced to the drug's existence through hair loss forums where almost everything you see about finasteride is negative, I was initially afraid of the drug and for a time I was convinced that taking it must have been giving me side effects, so therefore I initially wasn't using the drug consistently due to the constant fear of what I thought the drug was doing or would do to me and it cost me my hair Line, and I had to spend over $15,000 on hair transplants to even give it, get back a semblance of my original hair. However, upon becoming better read about the subject and about the actual incidence of finasteride side effects, I can say with the utmost certainty I have had no side effects from finasteride and using the drug has improved my overall quality of life tremendously. My only regret in my hair loss journey is that I even turned to the hair loss forums and subreddits to begin with when what I should have done for the beating was just go to my doctor, get on finasteride, and get on with my damn life rather than trying to get medical information from bro scientist morons online. That being said, for this video, I'm going to go ahead and put aside my own positive feelings towards finasteride as well as the fear mongering about finasteride and just take an objective look at the best research available on finasteride to figure out just how common the side effects of finasteride are so that people who are contemplating beginning therapy can make an informed decision about whether or not to take the drug in confidence knowing what the potential risk to benefit ratio is. Before I start though, I want to make it clear that this video is going to be an exploration about the incidence of finasteride's very 
horrified side effects. It isn't going to focus too heavily on speculative adverse effects that aren't grounded in any kind of quality scientific data or logic whatsoever, like the persistent side effects that allegedly persist indefinitely, as is as claimed by proponents of post-finasteride syndrome. If you are interested in the subject of post-finasteride syndrome and understanding in better detail about why it is not a real condition, then I will link three videos below that I made which cover the subject in great detail. For now though, let's go ahead and go balls deep into real research as opposed to the fake research from the PFS Foundation that they rely on and find out once and for all just how common are finasteride side effects. Now fortunately, being that finasteride is an FDA approved drug, that means that there are many clinical studies that have been done on finasteride. In, in particular, there is a very impressive review article which was published in 2017 by Fertig, which I'll go ahead and link below right now. And this article looks at all the previously published research on finasteride and also on dutasteride where they looked at side effects specifically. So this isn't about how effective finasteride and dutasteride are. We already know that both of these drugs work extremely well for fighting hair loss. Rather, this is just going to be an observation specifically about the sexual side effects of these drugs and other potential side effects like depression. Let's face it, most people who are worried about finasteride side effects are usually worried about its sexual side effects as well as its neurological side effects like depression. This is what concerns most people when they take finasteride or dutasteride. And even though these side effects are dramatically overblown, they are a real thing and people should have the right to know just how common they are so they can make a better informed decision before before beginning therapy. So establishing this incidence of finasteride side effects is what we're going to accomplish today, and we're going to do so by going over this review article. In this review article, the authors looked at every study they could find by using an exhaustive PubMed search, but fortunately, we can put these studies into some perspective here. There are two factors that are important in evaluating these studies. One is the number of subjects enrolled in each study. So clearly, a study that enrolled 10,000 subjects is more accurate than one that just had 15 subjects, for instance. So in this paper, the researchers discuss each study in order of descending size, but maybe even more importantly, they look at the quality of each study, grading each study's level of evidence from high to very low, as you can see here in this study gradient. But anyways, the highest quality studies are randomized controlled trials, while the lowest quality studies are observational studies or case reports, basically just anecdotes. Studies can be further downgraded due to problems with the study design or evidence of bias as well as inconsistent results or other theories. So even a study that is a randomized control study won't necessarily qualify as high quality research if, for example, the investigators in the study work for the drug company and therefore could be biased. Like for example, if we find out someone who is researching broccoli sprouts as a treatment for hair loss is also fundraising on Reddit to create his own topical formula that he wants to sell in order to allegedly fund further research, then we could safely conclude that this research is full of shit since collecting money to fund his research is clearly contingent on people believing it's real, so obviously he's going to be very biased. In all seriousness though, it is important to realize that not all studies are created equally or are equally valuable. For example, here is the pyramid of evidence from the American College of Physicians. At the top are meta-analyses where the data from multiple studies is analyzed like one big study, followed by that are systematic reviews, which is what the article we are going over today is, followed by this are randomized control trials, which are studies where groups of patients are randomly assigned to either a therapy or a placebo, and neither the subjects or the researchers know which treatment they are on, which reduces the chances of bias. Going lower down on the pyramid are cohort or observational studies where researchers look at subjects who have already received the treatment and then try to match them to other similar subjects that did not receive the same treatment. This is where we start to run into some limitations with research, since observational studies aren't blinded, and also it is very difficult to really find a control group that matches the treatment group, and that is why randomized control trials are the bare minimum necessity for FDA-approved drugs like finasteride and minoxidil. Going further down below observational studies, we have case reports, which are just documented anecdotes, basically, and the obvious problem with them is that you can't tell from a case report if it is just an outlier or if the results are caused by some other factor. It is very difficult to put case reports into a proper scientific perspective, so therefore, they definitely need to be verified with stronger evidence like a randomized control trial before they can be taken seriously. Even lower than this, though, are so-called expert opinions. This would be like you'd read in an editorial, and this is pretty easy to explain because oftentimes you see so-called experts who make claims
names that are complete broccoli. Just because you have an MD by your name doesn't make everything you say suddenly true. I mean, just look at Dr. McCullough, for instance. He runs a website where 99% of everything he says is wrong, but people will still believe him, believe him anyways just because he is a doctor. This is just an appeal to authority fallacy. A person is not relieved of their responsibility to qualify their arguments with strong scientific research just because they're a so-called expert. At the very bottom of this pyramid, though, is animal research or in vitro research. These kind of studies may be used to investigate mechanisms, but the most interesting theory in the world won't be any good until you have good outcome data from human clinical trials. This is why I put so much stock in human trials and why I don't feel that just case reports or in vitro studies are very important. Despite this, finasteride haters will very commonly hold animal research in high esteem. A classic example of this is when they bring up the role of finasteride's effects on neurosteroids, which they treat as strong evidence, when in reality, the methodology is extremely flawed because a rodent's brain responds to the type 2 5 AR enzyme differently from a human brain, and also the rodent subjects were on doses of finasteride equivalent to several hundred times higher than what a human would normally use for hair loss or even BPH. I'll post a link to my video on finasteride and neurosteroids if you're interested in that subject, but for this video, we're going to go over the research based on human trials since, after all, in in vitro research done on animals, this is considered to be the lowest tier of scientific evidence based on the pyramid that I just showed you. So, even though there is a large amount of data uh, on finasteride side effects, we can fortunately filter out the bad studies using this hierarchy and can come to reliable conclusions about the true incidence of finasteride side effects. So the authors of this review article looked at several topics. They looked at studies of finasteride at 5 milligrams per day, which was the original dose of finasteride when it was released as Proscar for the treatment of benign prostatic hypertrophy, also known as BPH, which is a prostate enlargement that occurs almost exclusively in older men. The researchers then looked at studies that compared 5 milligrams versus 1 milligrams of daily dosing of finasteride, and then at studies of finasteride at the 1 milligram dose, which was the dose the FDA approved as Propecia for treating androgenic alopecia. The authors then looked at side effects of dutasteride and compared dutasteride to finasteride to see which had more risk of side effects. But for the purpose of this video, we'll just concentrate on finasteride side effects and cover dutasteride side effects in a future video. The researchers then bring up the issue of whether there's any data to support finasteride having persistent side effects after stopping the drug, which is also of course known as post-finasteride syndrome. The researchers also look at the risk of depression from finasteride and how depression is possibly linked to sexual side effects. Finally, they look at an excellent meta-analysis that I think does the best job of answering the questions of the actual risk of finasteride side effects. So there is a lot to cover here, Chooms, so let's go ahead and hit on the high points of all this research. However, if you are interested in further details, then by all means take a look at the article itself posted below, which is freely available online with no paywall. So let's get to the first topic and take a look at finasteride at 5 milligrams per day first. Now, like I mentioned, this is the dose for enlarged prostate and is five times higher than the standard dose of finasteride for hair loss. But we can take five milligrams per day as a worst case scenario for finasteride's risk of side effects since it is the highest medically approved dose. Also, we have some absolutely enormous studies here. The biggest study on finasteride at five milligrams daily was the prostate cancer prevention trial, also known as PCPT, that enrolled 17,313 men with a seven year follow up. They used a questionnaire to evaluate sexual activity with a score of 0 to 100, with higher numbers being worse. At six months into the study, the sexual activity scores were worse in the finasteride group by 3.21 points versus the placebo group, and by the end of the study, after seven years, this number decreased to 2.11. These are actually very small differences when you consider this was a 100-point scale, and this worsening of sexual function from finasteride was less than the worsening of sexual function due to other factors like age, diabetes, high blood pressure, and smoking. Not surprisingly though, none of these thousands of men on finasteride at 5 milligrams a day had persistent side effects that continued after stopping the drug. The authors of the PCPT study concluded that finasteride had just minimal effects on sexual function. And again, I should remind you all that this PCPT study was the largest study of 5 milligrams per day of finasteride that has ever been done. But as you can see here, there are a number of other studies with fairly large numbers of subjects as well. These are all high quality studies and all show higher rates of sexual side effects with finasteride at 5 milligrams per day versus placebo. 
For example, the second study in the table called the Prowess Study had 3,168 subjects and the overall incidence of sexual side effects was 10% with finasteride at 5 mg per day versus 7% on placebo, with the incidence of decreased libido at 4% with finasteride versus 2.8% with placebo. The incidence of ejaculation disorder was at 2.1% with finasteride with 0.6% with placebo and the incidence of impotence was 6.6% with finasteride versus 4.7% with placebo. The other studies in this table give similar differences between finasteride and placebo, although the percentages vary quite a bit. So here are the remaining studies that looked at just 5 milligrams per day of finasteride, and here is where we are getting to some lower quality studies or studies with lower number of subjects. But I think we can conclude from all these studies that finasteride at 5 milligrams per day used in older men for prostatic hypertrophy causes worsening of sexual function in a small percentage of patients. The largest study, the PCP T study found that the incidence of sexual dysfunction decreased over time with finasteride's continued use, and none of these studies that included thousands of subjects found any evidence of persistent sexual side effects even after stopping finasteride. Again, these studies included tens of thousands of subjects on 5 milligrams of finasteride, which is five times the standard dose than what is prescribed for hair loss, and not a single one of them reported persistent sexual side effects after stopping finasteride. Not exactly a glowing endorsement for the existence of post-finasteride syndrome, I think. So anyways, we've talked a lot about 5 milligrams of finasteride, so let's move on to the studies comparing different doses of finasteride. The studies looking at 5 milligrams per day of finasteride are looking at older men with prostate problems, and both older age and prostate problems themselves can cause sexual dysfunction. So these studies may not be relevant to younger men taking just 1 milligram of finasteride per day for androgenic alopecia. So how does 1 milligram per day compared to 5 milligrams per day in terms of side effects. Well, the largest study was done by the finasteride study group who looked at 5 milligrams per day versus 1 milligram per day of finasteride versus placebo, but they again were looking at subjects with benign prostatic hypertrophy, BPH, not hair loss. This study included 895 men aged 40 to 83 years old. So again, this was an older patient population. In this patient population, both 5 milligrams and 1 milligrams of finasteride caused more sexual side effects than placebo, and surprisingly, 1 mg milligram of finasteride didn't seem to be much better than 5 milligrams of finasteride in preventing side effects. On 5 milligrams of finasteride, 4.7% of subjects had decreased libido, 4.4% had ejaculatory disorder, and 3.4% had impotence. For the 1 milligram group, 6% had decreased libido, 4.4% had ejaculatory disorder, and 5% had impotence. With placebo, only 1.3% had decreased libido, 1.7% had ejaculatory disorder, and 1.7% had impotence. So if anything, 1 milligram per day may have been slightly worse than 5 milligrams per day, but this is probably just a statistical fluke, and the differences were not statistically significant anyways. There are two other dosing studies that I covered in my last video, and in those studies, there was no difference between the incidence of side effects of any doses of finasteride versus placebo, as you could see here. And those studies were actually done in patients with androgenic alopecia, not prostate disease. So this implies that finasteride has less of an effect on sexual side effects when used in patients with androgenic alopecia versus those with prostate problems, and this is probably due to the fact that hair loss patients are younger than patients with prostate enlargement, and the older you get, the higher your chances of having sexual dysfunction are to begin with. Also, once again, in none of these studies so far were there any reports of side effects that persisted after the drug was stopped, and this is what I mean when I say that post-finasteride syndrome is a QAnon conspiracy theory. So, let's go ahead and move on to more relevant studies of people using finasteride at 1 mg per day or less for androgenic alopecia. The finasteride male pattern hair loss study looked at 1,553 men randomized to 1 mg of finasteride versus placebo. After one year, 4.2% of subjects reported sexual side effects on finasteride versus 2.2% in the placebo group. Only 11 men in the finasteride group and 8 men in the placebo group discontinued therapy due to sexual side effects 
effects, and the side effects all disappeared after stopping the drug. So this section of the table here shows the finasteride male pattern hair loss study I just mentioned, as well as three other studies looking at one milligram per day of finasteride. The Kawashima study actually looked at one milligram of finasteride versus 0.2 milligrams of finasteride versus placebo and found decreased libido in 2.9% with finasteride at one milligram per day, 1.5% on finasteride at 0.2 milligrams per day, and 2.2% on placebo, which does correspond to people reporting a reduced incidence of side effects when taking less than one milligram per day of finasteride, which is why people who do get sides or are afraid of sides at one milligram should consider a lower dose of finasteride. In this study, most cases of side effects resolved with continued treatment, and there were no discontinuations due to adverse side effects. So not a big difference here between drug and placebo in terms of side effects. And it also shows that people who do get side effects can usually just muscle through them without having to stop treatment. Now, looking at the study called the Leyden study, this one looked at 326 men at one on one milligram of finasteride per day versus placebo. The incidence of sexual side effects was 2% in both groups, and there were no discontinuations of the drugs due to side effects. So even compared to placebo, finasteride had no greater incidence of side effects in this study, and only 2% got side effects to begin with. Finally, the next study is called the Van Ness study, which included 212 patients on one milligram of finasteride versus placebo, and the incidence of sexual side effects was 1.9% on finasteride versus 0.9% on placebo. Obviously, a very small difference. However, the level of evidence for the study was considered just moderate by the researchers since it was a Merck-sponsored study, so maybe there was some bias. Even so, the risk of sexual side effects in all these other studies is low, not just the Merck-sponsored studies, so you can't say that there was bias everywhere. Also, in many of these studies, it is stated that side effects often resolve with continued therapy, and the discontinuation rates were very low amongst the subjects. Most importantly, up until this point, none of these studies reported any persistent side effects after stopping finasteride, and this includes the studies not sponsored by Merck, so you can't say that there is bias in these conclusions. As it turns out, though, in the 2000s, some research began appearing suggesting that finasteride was causing persistent side effects. So let's go ahead and examine these so-called persistent side effects, which is the bread and butter of the post-finasteride syndrome foundation. The first study that mentioned the possibility of persistent side effects after taking finasteride was the Proscar Long-Term Efficacy and Safety Study, or PLUS study, which was published in 2003. This was a study of 5 milligrams dosing of finasteride in patients with prostatic hypertrophy. There were 3,040 men aged 45 to 78 years old. In these subjects, there was a 15% incidence of sexual side effects on finasteride versus a 7% incidence on placebo, but only in the first year of treatment. After the first year, the incidence of sexual side effects was the same in both groups. Both had just a 7% incidence, which again shows that the side effects of finasteride will improve on their own with continued treatment. Of the patients who developed sexual side effects during the course of the study and discontinued their finasteride or placebo, some did report persistent sexual dysfunction. But in 50% of the patients who had been on finasteride, the sexual dysfunction resolved on its own. But in only 41% of the patients on placebo did the sexual dysfunction resolve. That's right, there were fewer persistent sides after stopping finasteride than stopping placebo. You can't make this shit up. This suggests that none of these patients' side effects were related to drug therapy. These patients just had sexual dysfunction from other causes, and sexual dysfunction is very common in this age group anyways. So people who report sexual dysfunction even years after stopping finasteride are getting sexual dysfunction from other causes and just conveniently blaming it on finasteride. So actually, this particular study is strong evidence against the existence of post-finasteride syndrome since the persistent sexual dysfunction was even more common in the placebo group than in the finasteride group. Anyways, after this high-quality study, which is strong evidence against the existence of post-finasteride syndrome, we get into two studies by our good friend Dr. Earwig. 
Oh yeah, and I should mention that the level of evidence in these studies was rated as, quote, very low, unquote. Now, anyone who has done research on finasteride has probably heard of Dr. Earwig, as he's similar to Dr. Trash in that most of the anti-finasteride research is linked to him and a handful of other doctors who are all part of the PFS cinematic universe. If you want to see a video where I go over Dr. Trash's research, I'll link that video below. But for now, let's focus on Dr. Earwig. In this study from Dr. Earwig, he interviewed 71 men aged 21 to 46 years old, all, all of whom supposedly experienced sexual side effects at least three months after stopping finasteride at one milligram per day. Right away, we run into a very serious problem with the study, and that is the fact that the men in the study were recruited from Dr. Earwig's own post-finasteride syndrome clinic and from the PropeciaHelpForums.com. Since in order to qualify for the study, all these men had to be complaining of sexual side effects after stopping finasteride, it is a no-brainer that these men had very frequent complaints of sexual dysfunction. 94% complained of low libido, 92% complained of erectile dysfunction, 92% complained of decreased arousal, and 9% complained of difficulty with orgasm. But what else would you expect to hear from people recruited from the goddamn Propecia Help Forum? You know, the same forum where people claim finasteride made their anus numb, made them gay, or made them transgender, or somehow inverted their penis. So of course these subjects are going to say finasteride did all these horrible things to them because they already were blaming finasteroid for every problem imaginable before they could even enter the study. Hell, they were recruited specifically because they allegedly had these symptoms, so this study is basically just a tautology. In other words, people complaining of sexual dysfunction indeed have symptoms of sexual dysfunction. The study does nothing whatsoever to establish any link between taking finasteroid and sexual dysfunction other than just saying, well, you know, that's just like your opinion, man. So... As a follow-up study to this first disaster of a study, Dr. Irwig looked at 54 of the original subjects from the first study 14 months later. Not surprisingly, 90% of them were still complaining of sexual dysfunction. Once again, this is not proof that their problems were due to taking finasteride. But this is the kind of garbage data that people quote all the time in the Propecia Help and Ray Pete forums, as well as all the hair loss forums and subreddits that are absolutely dominated by finasteride fear mongers. And just to remind you, the level of evidence here is considered to be rock bottom. I discuss all this in much greater detail in my videos on post finasteride syndrome, which I'll go ahead and link below. This does bring us to the question though, does finasteride cause depression and is there a link between depression and sexual side effects? Well, there is some evidence that people who complain of persistent finasteride side effects are actually depressed, but the important question here is, did finasteride cause the depression or were they depressed before taking finasteride? Hell, hair loss is pretty damn depressing enough as it is, so I think it is a very valid question. A small study by Basaria looked at 25 men who complained of persistent side effects who had previously used finasteride versus 13 men who had previously used finasteride without any side effects versus a control group of just 18 men. This was a retrospective study, meaning that the investigators chose the subjects and they weren't randomly assigned to therapy like in a randomized control trial. In the men with persistent sexual complaints, there was no evidence of androgen deficiency, androgen insensitivity, or inhibition of the 5 ARM enzyme. However, these men had evidence of depressed mood both clinically and on functional MRI scans. So were these men just flat out depressed with or without finasteride or could finasteride have caused their depression? Well, we actually have a study from Welk that includes the unbelievable number of 186,394 subjects. Sample sizes don't get much bigger than this. However, this was still just a retrospective study that matched patients on finasteride or dutasteride with matched control and it was still considered a high quality study. However, this study involves men with BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, not androgenic alopecia. The study found that there was no increase in the rate of suicide in the men on 5AR blockers versus control. However, there was an increase in the rate of self-harm just in the first 18 months of the study from an incidence of 0.14% in the control group to 0.18% incidence in the 5AR blocker group. There was an increase in the incidence of depression that decreased during the course of the study with an incidence of 1.37% in the control group and 1.95% incidence in the 5AR blocker group. This is a small difference, but with such a large number of patients, this is still statistically significant. So it does appear finasteride and dutasteride may increase the risk of depression slightly, though again, this is in the older benign prostatic hypertrophy age group, not in people being treated for androgenic alopecia.
Also, these subjects were people who were on either finasteride or dutasteride when they got their symptoms. They weren't people who had stopped the drugs and then reported persistent symptoms. So it is safe to say that finasteride does have a very small chance of causing depression. Though remember, this study was done at dose levels of 5 milligrams per day, not the usual 1 milligram per day dose for treating hair loss. The only other study rated as high quality on finasteride and depression was by Melkonji. In this study, there were 16 men with depression who had been treated with one milligram per day of finasteride, an average of 5.4 years beforehand, which is a very long time. I mean, what else could have happened in those 5.4 years that could have caused depression, and what other drugs did they take in the meantime? Anyways, these 16 men were compared to 25 healthy control subjects. They found in the treatment group that 14 out of the 16 had subabnormalities of spinal fluid or plasma neurosteroids, 50% of them had major depression, and 25% had neuropathy of the pudendal nerve, which is the main nerve of the genital region. 63% had severe erectile dysfunction and 100% had some level of erectile dysfunction. That sounds really scary and naturally this data is exploited by finasteride haters all the goddamn time. A big problem with this study though is that instead of comparing normal controls, they should have compared a group with erectile dysfunction or depression that never took finasteride. It's likely that depression itself is associated with abnormal neurosteroids, but there's no reason to blame the on finasteride because they could have had depression from some other factor. If the researchers were to compare these subjects to a comparable group of people with depression who had never taken finasteride, it's likely they would have found similar abnormalities. So this study is really flawed and doesn't prove anything. As for the other studies on depression and finasteride, as you can see here, they all range from moderate to very low levels of quality of evidence. For instance, most have no control group, some draw their subjects from the Propecia Help Forum, and then gave them questionnaires. So it's very predictable how they were going to answer these questionnaires. One study used what is called the FAERs, also known as the FAERS database, which is the drug equivalent of the vaccine VAERS database, where anyone can pretty much report any side effect using an online form which makes the data very suspect because anyone, including people from the Propecia Help Forums or the PFS Foundation, can now submit whatever bogus claim they want about finasteride and it will skew the overall data outcomes. There is one study by Ganser though which was interesting and I went over the study in one of my post-finasteride syndrome videos. The researchers in this Ganser study found that 55% of the subjects reporting long-term side effects from finasteride had a psychiatric diagnosis before getting finasteride and 29 percent of them had a first degree relative with psychiatric problems. This makes me wonder if the depression and sexual problems were actually potentially present even before these people got finasteride. So with all these concerns about possible depression and long-term side effects being linked to finasteride, the FDA in 2011 looked at their post-marketing data from 1997 to 2011, which essentially is the FAERS database. They found 59 cases of sexual dysfunction lasting three or more months after stopping finasteride at least supposedly. In 20 cases, this sexual dysfunction lasted over three years. Some of these cases were associated with low levels of testosterone, which is not something linked to finasteride, since remember, finasteride raises testosterone. In any case though, with an abundance of caution and probably to help stop lawsuits, Merck added depression and the possibility of long-term sexual side effects to their labeling for Propecia. This obviously was not warranted by the scientific data, although I can understand Merck's desire to add it with the intention of reducing the risk of lawsuits against them. Unfortunately, this labeling did just the opposite and it completely backfired. To quote from a book chapter on this whole affair, Quote, shortly after Merck revised its label, thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of websites claim that Propecia and finasteride cause erectile dysfunction and loss of libido. In addition, dozens of lawsuits and support group websites were formed. As of the writing of this chapter, a Google search yielded the following number of results. So this labeling change was really when post-finasteride syndrome started booming because post-finasteride syndrome is not a real disease. It is a business driven by litigation and groups like the PFS Foundation and Propecia Health who are all looking to cash in on this huge money train. Unfortunately, sexual dysfunction and depression are very common conditions amongst young adult men, probably even more so in young men suffering from hair loss. In a study of 27,839 men not taking finasteride, 
Sexual dysfunction was found in 11% of men between 30 and 39 years of age. And it was found that 8% of men between 20 and 29 years of age also had erectile dysfunction. Also, according to the World Health Organization, depression affects about 5% of young adults. Finasteride is a very frequently prescribed drug. There are about 9 million prescriptions written for it in 2019 alone. It is therefore relatively easy to find large groups of people with sexual dysfunction or depression who at one time in their lives may have taken finasteride. You could also find large groups of people with these problems who at one time may have taken aspirin or taken broccoli or had any other similar characteristics. If people are told that finasteride causes permanent sexual dysfunction and they get sexual dysfunction after taking finasteride, they will definitely believe finasteride is the drug that is responsible for it. So even though it does appear finasteride may cause a slightly increased incidence of sexual dysfunction and even perhaps depression, that's a long way off from believing that finasteride causes permanent damage to your sexual function or causes permanent depression or something of the sort. This has not been proven at all, and even if you are one of the very few people who do get side effects from finasteride, the side effects will usually go away on their own with continued use, and failing that, you can always titrate the dose to smaller doses like 0.5 or 0.25 milligrams daily or even every other day, and I talk about that in my last video, which I'll link below. So let's close all this with a meta-analysis, which if you may remember, is the absolute highest level of medical evidence based on the pyramid I showed earlier. This study was published in 2016 by Liu, and he looked at 17,494 subjects drawn from 17 randomized controlled studies. Nine of the studies were for benign prostatic hypertrophy, and eight were for androgenic alopecia. They looked at what's called relative risk, which means how much more risk is there for the treatment versus placebo. For example, a relative risk of two would mean the risk was double the risk in the control group. However, remember, this may sound worse than it really is because the absolute risk is very important too. Here's an example. If the risk of a side effect is 0.3% in the control group and the relative risk is 2 in the treatment group, then the absolute risk in the treatment group would be 0.6% with a difference of only 0.3% between the two groups in absolute risk. So keeping that in mind, for men with benign prosthetic hypertrophy, BPH, the relative risk of sexual dysfunction for finasteride at 5 milligrams per day was 2.56 compared to the control group. For men with androgenic alopecia, the relative risk was much lower, just 1.21. For erectile dysfunction, the relative risk for BPH was 1.55, but for androgenic alopecia, the risk of getting erectile dysfunction was lower than control at just 0.66. For decreased libido, the relative risk for BPH was 1.69. For androgenic alopecia, the relative risk was 1.16. So that's pretty low. This meta-analysis concluded that there was a significant significant increased risk of sexual adverse events for men who take finasteride or do tasteride for BPH. However, there was not a significant increased risk of sexual adverse effects for men taking 5-AR blockers for androgenic alopecia. So this meta-analysis suggests that the risk of sexual side effects with finasteride is increased when it is given to older men at higher doses, but it actually didn't find any statistically significant risk of increased sexual side effects in younger men with androgenic alopecia taking 1 milligram per day of finasteride. This is strong evidence that the risk of increased sexual side effects in men taking low doses of finasteride for androgenic alopecia is at most pretty minimal. So what can we conclude from all these studies, some of which are conflicting? First of all, when we look at finasteride at one milligram per day for antritic alopecia, the risk of sexual side effects or depression seems very minimal across all the studies. Using five milligrams per day for BPH is associated with a higher risk, but remember, these are older men with prostate problems, so they have a higher incidence of sexual dysfunction to begin with. Secondly, many studies show that sexual side effects can diminish or disappear even while continuing to take finasteride. Third, up until the early 2000s, there were no reports reports of persistent side effects after stopping finasteride, even though the drug has been on the market since 1992. These reports of post-finasteride syndrome really took off only in 2011 when the FDA added new warnings to the Propecia labeling and have been fueled by lawsuits from sites like the PropeciaHelp.com forums as well as the PFS Foundation. So rest assured, the safety of finasteride rests on a real solid scientific foundation, and don't believe what you hear anecdotally. The horror stories about finasteride you hear online 
online are not grounded in any strong scientific data whatsoever. On the contrary, the strongest scientific research as we've gone over already shows that the risk of side effects is low and easily managed through titration adjustments. When people tell you that you shouldn't use finasteride, they're not telling you that for your own sake, they're telling you that for their own sake. Finasteride fear mongers do not have the grit, guts, or balls to save their own hair, and scaring other people into giving up the good fight is just their way of coping with their lack of courage to use finasteride themselves. Misery loves company, and every time those fear mongers hear about someone who takes finasteride and had a good experience with the drug, it is another reminder of their failures. So they do not want you to succeed, and that is why you should not listen to them. Listen to your doctor, trust the science, and trust your own goddamn instincts. Nobody can predict how well you're going to respond to finasteride, but anybody can predict what will happen if you don't use finasteride. Tell us, are you turned on or turned off? <laughs> Don't be a ball cell, get on finasteride, and get on with your own goddamn life. And with that, good luck on the path, my fellow hair loss witchers. I'll see you next time. See ya.